Hey everybody, welcome back to Conversations in Pop Culture, and we are back in the saddle once again for another season, and I have with me comic creator Travis Gibb. So welcome back to the show, because what is this, like your sixth or seventh time now? Yeah, I think I've been on all the seasons, which is nice. There's only there's only four. There's only four, so, so, so it's not that hard to do it. There, there, but I think I've been on all four. I, I, I Not everybody's been on all four. I think it's a, a proud accomplishment to be on all four. It, it could be. It could be. I mean, uh, you know, you know, you, you, I think you're in the five time club at least. Right. You know, so far, you're on all four seasons. I don't know what, what other achievements we can drop here, but obviously, I'm always happy to have you on to talk about whatever you got going on, whether you that. got a comic, you're editing a book, you're doing something in an anthology. And obviously, you have a book right now that's coming out, I think, tomorrow in stores. Which yeah, is- yeah, yeah. This is a different thing. Normally, we're pitching my Kickstarters, but this is we're pitching on my direct market. This is the first book that I've done fully with the direct market. I've done stuff with the direct market, but this is the first, you know, single issue of a, a book that I own that's going on the direct market. So, yeah, it's uh, this baby right here. Yeah. Yeah. So, 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 yeah, let, let's talk about that. So, obviously, it's Coins of Judas. And I don't think that I need to explain the whole Judas story. But it's a very interesting premise for a book. And so what is that premise for people who are hearing about it for the first time, have no idea, are just going to go into their comic shop potentially tomorrow, which they should, because I think the book is going to be a little bit hard to find, potentially. It um, is. Yeah, yeah. I, I mean, if you, it's sold out. So hopefully you pre-ordered it. And if you didn't pre-order it, hopefully you can somehow get it on the secondary market or from Band of Bards. But please look for it. And please ask your comic store to order it, because that's how they get more like a second print or anything is by asking for it, but coins of Judas. So 2000 ish years ago, a dude threw down uh, 30 pieces of silver in front of uh, Pharisees and those Pharisees uh, were trying to betray Christ, trying to give it to pay him for betraying where, where Jesus Christ says those 30 pieces of silver unbeknownst to all of us were demons. Those demons were from unsanctified coins in Jewish tradition. If you're not aware when uh, a money went into the church back in the day, they actually had to sanctify it. So if money went out to do something uh, like betraying someone or, or killing someone, uh, it would have to be unsanctified. Those unsanctified coins made demons. Demon hunters became a thing, and they've been hunting down and killing these 30 demons for years, trying to hunt them. They're, they're out in the wild doing crazy things. And this is a brother and sister a team that's trying to hunt these demons because their dad died while trying to hunt one of the one of the 30 pieces. Yeah, let's talk a little bit about that because it's super interesting because obviously their dad is part of this family. And I think it's like the Western Guard, I want to say. Western Guard, yep, mm-hmm. absolutely. And so obviously this has been a generational thing where they've been hunting these things down for centuries upon centuries, I take. And, and that, that, that was at least what I, what I got out of the book because I did read the book, got a little sneak preview of it. Yeah. Um, And so obviously he gets killed in battle or hunting it down. And he obviously has some fun toys as well. And then it raises questions on, well, his kids are well aware that he got killed in battle. And then the sister and the brother are not exactly on the same page. And things are complicated to certain degrees where obviously some orders have fallen there's an internal strife, I guess, between different groups that want to hunt these things down. Right. And yeah, the sister doesn't want anything to do with it after doing what, like a five-year prison sentence? Yeah, she did a five-year prison sentence. We talked about that in the first issue. Uh, There is a a building that was burnt down. We're not sure why or how or whatever, but yes, there was a building that was burnt down and she was blamed for it. And so now she and her brother are sort of on the same page of demon killing. But they're not. And it raises a lot of questions on what's going on and what even their relationship looks like, despite this problem still existing of finding these 30 pieces of silver and essentially getting rid of this demon problem. Right. Yeah. Yeah. So that's trying to get them, you know, as we point out in this book, that this is a generation of family of of demon hunters and there's other orders that are doing it. And not all of them may be good, you know, who, who want these these things. It's it's a fascinating book. Uh, the origin story of this book is 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 crazy as well. I, have I ever told you the origin story of this, Andrew? I don't think you did, because because I don't think that the last time we spoke, this was uh, even on the table. Right. It's just that it's impetus, and you really couldn't speak about it. 
Yeah, yeah, yeah. So what happened was I wrote a, a story called Children of Judas, which was uh, for the Mad Cave Talon search. Uh, I did a Wolf and Heart story, and I did, I, I did it, and uh, they didn't accept it, which is fine. Um, and then this company called Band of Bards, who I've been paying attention to, they asked uh, me if I'd be part of an anthology. They were trying to ask, uh, you know, some creators to be it. So I submitted to it, reworked that story, removed the Wolf and Heart story character and added my own character, added some twists, um, submitted it, and they declined me. They wrote this nice letter that said, hey, we're not interested in your story uh, for this anthology. However, we'd like to make it be a whole series. I'm like, What? So I did, and I worked with Tyler Carpenter. Tyler's been a friend of mine for years, you know. Um, and what's really cool about it is, you, you and I have talked about this, manga isn't my first love. Like, I don't know a lot about the manga. Society, the groups, you know, the artists who are good, you know, you and I talk many times. You don't know this guy? I was like, oh, I don't know them because they do a manga style. I don't love that. Um, but uh, Tyler does a manga style, and I, I like Tyler as a person. I like him as a creator, and we've teamed up on some small projects. But yeah, so I ended up kind of doing a mangaish book. And you read the first issue. I kind of took some manga influences, like crazy fight scenes, like different colors, the, the way they're done. Like uh, I tried to take some manga influence, so kind of hybrid between the two. Yeah, so let's even talk about this too, because it's a very interesting book because obviously it's for Bands of Bards comics. Mm -hmm. And it's a direct thing first, if it even comes to Kickstarter, it may or may not. Um, at this point, I don't think anybody really knows um, in that realm. Um, and obviously it's in Diamond. And then, but you also got to call your shots in a lot of ways. I think most of it, I don't know if the whole, you know, I think you forming the team was your whole call or if they wanted somebody on there. But I know Tyler was your call. I know Stan Yak on one of the covers was yeah. your call. I think, um, yeah, I forget his name. Um, uh, it's Jerome. Something. Jerome Gettin. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's it's all my call for production and team. In fact, even in the book, you'll see the orange cone logo and you'll see Tyler's logo in there to show that we they partnered with us. You know, that's the way they run business, which is really cool. They want to partner with you and, and make your thing, which is really nice. So yeah, uh, that it was a it was a whole partnership uh, to do that. And yes, to answer your question, there is going to be a Kickstarter, but. It's going to be down the road after the diamond release. So if you want to read them now, you know that, and it's only going to be in a trade, not single issues. And, and the reason why I bring this up is that it's a very interesting thing when you come into a company is a lot of times if you go to a Marvel or a DC, or if you're going and doing somebody's book for, you know, another publisher, they might team you up with an artist. They might have an in-house letter. They might have somebody who, you know, is an in-house variant. And in this case, you have to make all those calls. So what was that like? Because it's not normal, for lack of a better word. Uh, it was so flattering, right? Um, kinda, you always ask those tough questions where I can't say everything that I'm thinking. Uh, so give me a second. I've worked for other publishers that I, I don't have control. Uh, and and that's not there's nothing wrong with that. Like they run their business away stuff. But it was really like going Band of Bards going, we fully trust you. You know what you're doing. You know how to do this. Can you do this? Uh, and I think that I've done really well by them. I'm their best selling uh, book so far. Uh, I'm their sold out. Uh, you know, Diamond sold out of it. I sold um, variant covers, nine variant covers on it, which is really, really cool. Um, and I got to help build the variant cover program to make it affordable for people to invest in it at a, at a good rate. So that's been really cool to see that all this hard work that I've been doing on Kickstarter and like my name in the community like matters to certain publishers, right? Because the higher I go up, the less that matters, right? They're like, we worked with Cullen Bunn or we worked with Jason Ayer, we worked with blah, blah, blah. My name means a lot less as the higher I go up. So it's really good to get someone on my level who we partner really well with and can build that. Yeah, so let's even talk about that too, because obviously, I mean, I've watched the market and the market has become very interesting in comics. Right. And so obviously a lot of people are talented writers. You know, I think you're included in there, but then you also Thank have you. people who just are really good at marketing their book. And also there's business decisions. There's also an element of cloud. And so what is this like that a publisher trusts you and that all these small publishers are really popping up in mid-level publishers because they're the ones who are taking market share. 
they're not putting Marvel or DC or Image out of business anytime soon. But these small publishers and mid-level publishers are really starting to carve out a niche and a niche for themselves. And what is that like to be somewhat at the ground floor, but also help build that up? Because I think it builds a resume in a lot of ways. You know, I just started a new job a little while ago and I'm building infrastructure in my job. And I hope I never leave my job. But if I go to another company and I built infrastructure over two years in my company, and then I can say, look, I've already done this. And then I can come in and do it for you too. And so what is that like? Because it puts you in a very interesting position, not necessarily as a writer, but more on the business side of things. Yeah, I mean, those are really tough questions. And I think 2023 is going to be the toughest time for indie comics. I really do. Uh, I, I, don't I don't think it's just indie comics. I think it's business in general. But continue. Maybe, but but you know, my focus, my focus as a whole is indie, just indie comics, because that's what I want to do for a living. The aftershock. I don't think people realize how big of a deal aftershock, uh, the bankruptcy of aftershock, affects people. Aftershock was that achievable goal for most of us. Aftershock has a good enough name. Uh, you know, they had a good track record of sixty or so percent of them going up to like the Dark Horse and the Image and the Marvel and DC. They had that track record and they had a pretty open look. You know, they produced like 10 or 12 books a month. So they had a pretty good ability to get to that frame. With them being gone, all the other ones have to pick up that slack. So Source Point and Scout and all these. So it kind of spreads the market out. Um, and I also think that some of those big creators, like who haven't done Kickstarter, who've done a couple of small things here and there, they're going to probably come to Kickstarter and they're going to kick ass and they're going to take a lot of money from the Kickstarter audience because they can't go to Aftershock, right? Because Aftershock was a trusted place where they could go. So I think 2023 is going to really shake up the comics industry. And I think a band of bards, you know, much like you said, these new companies coming up, they're going to need to make sure they have something special that people are going to latch on to because the money is not earned. The average indie comic sales is less than a thousand these days. It's less than a thousand copies. You might as well just go to Kickstarter because you're, if you're going to sell less than a thousand, you might as well go to Kickstarter because you're not going to make a lot of money when you factor up how much, you know, they, cause they buy it at half and then blah, 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 blah. It all trickles down to 30 cents to you. Right. So let's actually talk about this because I made a video almost two Fridays ago, talking about the bankruptcies with Frankie's Comics and mm -hmm. Aftershock. And somebody was supposed to join me, they couldn't make it, so I just said, fuck it, I'm going to do it by myself. Right. And I was explaining what bankruptcy is. And for those who don't know, bankruptcy is a financial tool. So right. Frankie, Frankie's Comics, the, the short term of that is it's a million dollars. A million dollars in the scheme of things is not a lot. Aftershock is 50 it, what what it looks like. And so I don't even think it's, I think that's part of it. But I think the other part is that you now also, it's going to stifle, I feel, some maybe TV deals and some other stuff and also some licensing, toys, maybe merch. And I think it even goes beyond just, you know, the comic side of it. I think it goes also into the idea of saying, can a company or is a company really going to go and potentially try to sell a pilot? And I think the aftershock thing is a big discouragement. I don't think it's an impossible thing, but I think companies, even Dark Horse or Source Point or Scout, might not be so willing to say, you know what is, we have a good enough business. We don't really want to pursue television or a film at the moment. And I think that is going to be a big issue because I think that's also a problem in comics right now. Where I feel like a lot of people in comics are writing to sort of pitch to Netflix. And in a lot of ways, and I think that this is a big deterrent. And I even think Netflix and Disney and Hulu and Paramount are going to be like, maybe we don't want to do what Aftershock did. And I think that's also a big ripple, too, because right. when your comic gets optioned for a movie or a television show, no matter what people say, I'm not writing for that. It's a big paycheck and it also increases the value. And I right. think if you're a creator, you have to maybe not think about it front and center, but you have to have it in the back of your head. So that, that, that's my take on Aftershock more so because I think a little bit different, not as a creator, but on the business side of things. Sure. Yeah, I think a lot of people thought Aftershock, you know, bankruptcy doesn't mean debt. In fact, they're producing books, books for Aftershock coming out this week, you know, because they need to keep some things going. And a lot of that debt, from what I understand, and I don't know if this is true. So if I'm speaking out of turn, I heard that a lot of that's a printer that they own. 
So they own the printer that that a lot of this this that, that debt comes from is is their own printer. So a lot of that those okay. debts are their own debts. Yeah. You know, they're they're paying their self back for stuff. But part so, of it so, is and also part of it is production on some stuff. Right. With movies. So 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 that's where it gets complicated. But I agree on the printer debt is they're borrowing from themselves. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So so I think that that's uh, something that element. But if you look at TV. I think that comics, uh, I think the time that they were just grabbing up IPs is kind of dead. We look at Why the Last Man, one of the biggest selling comics of all time, did, did, did not make enough to make a season two. Warrior Nun got two seasons done, like it, it couldn't couldn't produce stuff. Uh, Runaways, even like stuff that's Marvel and DC, couldn't produce more than, I think they did three seasons. And that's with a low budget. You know, a lot of these things are not making the the stuff. Even Old Guard, Old Guard is a great TV show, but most people don't even know it's based off a comic at all. Like they're just like whatever, you know. So I think all these things, uh, and and you can tell by the changes in the movie industry, the comic book being adapted from a comic book is now a footnote, versus before that was the top thing from hit indie comic blah blah blah. This now it's Da da da! This is a great thing. Oh, also based off a comic book. It's a it's a small small like kind of like a Hallmark movie. They're all books before, sure, but they're whatever, you know. Because <laughs> because I I just think it's very interesting because I think you brought up a really good point where also with aftershock and to even go back to the Kickstarter thing is that I think that it is gonna you know force people to come onto Kickstarter or right. onto Indiegogo or you know a Zoop or a crowdfunder. Um, and I don't, I mean, pick your poison, whichever one, but the competition is still fierce on all those platforms. Whether right. you go Indiegogo or Kickstarter, which are the two big ones, it's still going to be tough. And if you're a brand new creator and you're trying to squeak out an audience, or let's say you did three grand on a book, on your first book, that three grand might not be there. And I think it's a real issue. And, right. and, and I think it's it, because I'll be very honest. I mean, I can tell you the last six months just selling comics it's been soft on the collector's market. And I don't really foresee that the regular market, I don't think is doing well either right now. And so what, what is this like for you? Obviously having an established name, but it also must be a little scary too at the same time, because all of a sudden, you know, I'll throw a name out there. Kyle Higgins comes on to Kickstarter. A lot of money's going to flock to Kyle Higgins very quickly and nothing against you, but like, he has a huge fan base. And now does that because the saying is that a rising tide lifts all ships. But I don't know if that's going to be true if there's like four mega stars on Kickstarter all at the same time. And then what happens when somebody has 20 bucks left? Where do they go? And there's, I guess, the next generation, for lack of a better word. Yeah, the I think Kyle Higgins is a great example because he's a medium sized star. Like in the grand scheme of things, not like in the world, but he's a medium sized star. He is more of a threat to me than a Keanu Reeves, right? A Keanu Reeves coming, he's bringing a whole bunch of new people to the platform who may see my stuff. So the the amount of people that he's bringing is is massive, versus a Kyle Higgins who is he's he's big, but he's not gonna he's not gonna make a two hundred thousand, you know, um, more than likely he may, but more than likely not. You know, the, those those things don't come o- over time. So those things are a threat and a worry to me. I, I'm not too worried about it because I have a fan base and I have a Kickstarter fan base. But I think new creators definitely need to worry about that. I think they're going to be a stuff. And I think that the the industry is working against us. I think things like whatnot are hurting. I think um, I think COVID did really good to get people, stayed people home and people cared about their coll- collectibles a little bit more. They cared about the, co- the entertainment because no new TV and stuff came out for a bit. So their comics mattered to them a little bit more. So they're like, oh, I want to get better issues. And the collector's market kind of blew up and it helped the collector's market. But then whatnot came and like you could sell all these variant covers and this and that. And then it blew up to, to be the 90s. And now it's kind of putting itself back right to where it needs to be and what's going to happen with that and, and how that's going to look. And if you notice whatnot, what not all it's doing right now is is 
prospecting, right? It's like, we're going to make a metal cover for this book that you've never heard of 25 that got an option that maybe you may be able to get. We're going to sell that for a high amount versus just a variant cover that came out weekly. Like the things it, that are it's very tricky. It's very tricky. So this is my space, right? Yeah. And, and the problem with whatnot is that whatnot with sports cards and comics, it's not even good deals. It's really not. If you go and compare, I mean, you can go and find some of this stuff that people are just selling, even tabling the variant stuff right. and the exclusives. Some of the stuff that people sell, it's overpriced significantly. And what they did very cool is they made it social. And mm -hmm. when people were lonely in COVID or you couldn't go see your friends, you felt like I have, you know, my bro is selling me something. So you're willing to pay more money for it. And they make it social. It's fun. A creator's talking to you or a shop owner's talking to you. And you buy something, but and you feel like you're part of the conversation, but it's really not great deals on whatnot. And things are way overpriced. It's a real problem. It is very hard to buy something off of whatnot and then turn it for a profit. And you have to long it, and there's a lot of risk involved. And this is like my space. This is why I tried whatnot. I bought some cards on whatnot, and then I'm like, this is really, really pricey what I just bought. Right. And it's I'm probably going to break even, maybe make a little bit of money, but I'm not making a killing. And I think that's a big issue. And I think, you know, I don't know how many people really care or how many people are educated. And that's the other thing, too, is that when you're prospecting on variants, you know, you need to have that education. And that's a big problem. And then it deters people away from things because then they lose their shirt. And then that's what happens. Well, hopefully this will not lose me a gig, but I'm going to say something here that, that may lose me a gig in the future. You ready, Andrew? I okay. think, I'm with you in, in the foxhole, so don't worry. All right. I think whatnot is not a real business. I think it's designed to sell. I think it's built every strategic thing they're doing. They're like less than two years old, and they've already bought a publishing company to go against all the publishers who are on the platform. The only reason to do that is uh, the greatest thing about publishing. This book is $5, right? But as an option, it could be whatever money I decide that option is. If I attach someone cool to it, it becomes an even bigger option, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So when you grab publishing books and then you publish things with Wesley Snipes and things like that right off the bat, it's adding value to your company. And I believe the goal of whatnot is to just get big and sell. Like, look how much they spend at conventions, how much part of conventions they have. Um, and that, that makes me believe that, that that is one of their goals. Hold on one second. Sorry, they, I had to yell because they were kicking and then the dogs think somebody's here and they're barking. And... It's all good. It's all good. No. I, I think I think that, that they are trying to become a competitor to eBay, essentially, yeah. and Macari, and that's what I think they're doing. And they basically added the social element to it. And I would not be surprised at some point if they wanted to go public and have an IPO. Would not surprise me. Would not surprise me at any point because, let's be realistic, you're becoming bigger, and that's the end goal so that all the founders can have shares that then could be cashed out or all the investors. And that's just my spec. And, again – I'm sure it's going to hunt me too because I'm in this space and I am sure there are people who are not going to be happy with you or me when, when we just said that. Um, but I don't think it's anything that's not untrue and that people wouldn't figure out eventually either. And I don't think it's malicious to say that. Like, I don't think it's a bad thing. I just, that's the way I see the company. Like if, if whatnot wanted to publish one of my books, I would really second guess it because it's, it's a company that most comic stores don't like because they're like, you're my competition. <laughs> like, like people can buy it for you. You're my competition. And then the ones that fully embrace it, those ones are all about flipping. So they're a different type of comic store. They're not a reader comic store. And my goal, the best plan for me to level up is to get to readers, right? So that whatnot doesn't work with, with those two demographics. You know, uh, and, uh, but again, I've only picked up one whatnot book. It was okay. Um, I'm going to pick up the Wesley Snipes stuff. So maybe I'm wrong. Maybe if I read them, you know, I, I have a different view on it, you know. What, what, what is the Wesley Snipes book? Is that Adam Gibson's book or um, 
Uh, yeah, yeah, I think you had him on your show. Um, he, 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 he flaked out. And, and, oh, okay. and I was so disappointed. I was so disappointed. I'm like, what happened? And then, you know, what is? I got fed up and I just said, you know what? I'm just going to just move forward and maybe somewhere down the road, it'll all work out where. Yeah, you know, that book, that Kickstarter book got picked up. Yeah, well, well um, I, I have my own opinions about that book. I, I Everybody knows my opinion about that book. Yeah, that, that book got picked up by Whatnot, so it's in the Whatnot catalog. They've got, I will tell you this, though, if you look at the covers, they, they've they been genius. They've grabbed all of Wesley Snipes' best movies and did homage variants. Uh, and I kind of want a few of them, I'm, I'm going to be honest. So they, they at least got that right. <laughs> yeah, no, I mean, I mean, I mean, you know what it is from a collector's position? They, they, it's, it's different. Again, this is my space mm -hmm. extensively. Right. Um, but yeah, no, I mean, I don't, I haven't seen any of it. I just know that, you know, obviously they're doing something right because right, they have sure. audience and you know, it's, it's tricky, but the real question is that how long can it last? And I think that that is one of the biggest questions, but I do think that it is very complicated going into 2023 with new Kickstarters. And even if you are a stylish creator and I'm going to use an R word, it's not the R word everybody's thinking of it's relationships. I think I think 2023, much like 2020 and 2021, is going to be a relationship building year, and I think it's a real issue that people in comics have forgotten, and that's just my view on on it. Where you need to make sure your relationships are pretty solid this year. I feel going into it where you need to be friends with a lot of people who have you know podcasts and other kickstarters, and I'm curious your thoughts on that because you know that that's how I see it. And I have a feeling that when things get rough, you know, doing a lot of interviews, having people push out yourself, also partnerships, knowing who you can call, who can help you out, who can introduce you. I think all that's going to play a big role. And I think it's going to play a big role even in 2024. Yeah, I, I think the Kickstarters that are going to make it this year are people who have been in the space for a while and then people who promote each other, like the doing it like we've always done. I don't think if you change the way it, it, it works or try to change that, it's it's not going to work out for you. And I think because I think a lot of new people are coming to the space uh, to, to do some stuff. Um, so it's it's going to be wild seeing how, how it all pans out and how the next uh, so, months go. I, I think publishers as well. I know a lot of publishers are not taking submissions right now. Um, so like there is there's a you going to have to go to Kickstarter if you're going to want a new book. I think we're going to get some great creators over over there. And hopefully us who've been doing it for a while are going to be able to, to keep our position. So let, let me ask you a question, because do you also think that it's also going to force creativity on how you structure a Kickstarter, what you bring to a Kickstarter, also new products, new artists, new concept with it, with um, books? So I can't think of like a new concept off the top of my head. Um, but like having potentially, you know, some weird foil variants or having something that's even a weirder goal, you know, or something along those lines, because I think that's also what's going to dictate success and mm -hmm. failure is bringing something that hasn't been done, not necessarily in story, you know, first and foremost, but even in art style and even in what are you offering as, you know, a reward. So for instance, you know, I'm drinking out of my Bob Ross mug guys. So, you know, I haven't seen this be done, but what if somebody did, you know, a mug like this that paints itself and water is full with all your characters. And I think that's something that's going to be very interesting because let's be realistic. I mean, Kickstarter, you have to figure a way how to stand out at yeah. this point. And I think that's one of the biggest things because you and me both go to comic shops. There's a lot of comics on the wall. When you go to a comic shop and you don't know any book, I mean, I'm going to ask you a question. You've been into a comic shop and you were saying, I don't know what book I want to buy, right? And then what makes you pick up a book? Yeah. Because something makes it stand out, right? And so I'm just curious where you think that's going because I hate to say this, but like I look at like 20 campaigns and I just had $30 and I was like, cool, that cover looks great. I knew nothing about the book, but the cover looked great. And the other 19 just didn't stand out to me. So I'm very curious how you feel about that because 
that to me, I feel is going to be one of the biggest deciding factors. Yeah. I think, I think one of the things that's going to happen, and I think people started realizing it at the end of last year is I think Kickstarter prices are going to have to go down. I think, the, I think they're, that I too. think, uh, which sucks uh, because I think we all want to make money. Uh, we all need to make money, uh, but I think we're going to have to limit it a little bit to, to get to where we need to go. I know that shipping prices literally just upped yesterday. And I, I get that things are crazy, but I think that Kickstarter price are going to have to go down to, to fit the market to, to do that. Uh, the other thing is I, I think when you're, when we're talking, you know, comic store versus Kickstarter, um, you know, comic stores, have, comic stores every month, your stuff, like Coins of Judas, when you go into your comic store this week, I guarantee it'll look like this. DC, Marvel, Image, Dark Horse, Zenoscope, all the names. And then at the bottom row, you'll have my book and a few other uh, other independent stuff. Scout, Source Boy, and all that stuff. Uh, so it's really hard to stand out because you're the last thing that people look for. So all of those other people have taken your money every time they're like, oh, I need this issue of Batman. Oh, I like this cover because it has punchline. All that, and then you are the last decision. So it's going to be really hard. On Kickstarter, it's a little different because it's only like 150 on the platform at a time, maybe 200 uh, Kickstarters at this time. You know, that may change. Um, but uh, to get those stuff, you're going to have to be affordable. You're going to have to make something unique, and you're going to have to have a proven record because too many people are being screwed over on the regular on Kickstarter and not fulfilling. It's happening more frequently, and I think it's happening more frequently not because people are bad people. I think we are the, the the economy right now is really tough. And they spent a little bit of that that five grand that they're supposed to fit for printing. They spent a little bit more and a little bit more and a little bit more, a little bit more, and then it was gone. And they didn't know how to do it. And they are trying to get it back. And I guarantee you'll see a whole bunch of Kickstarters that have been waiting fulfilled after tax return. But that's not the way it's supposed to work, guys. Like it is what it is. Yeah, I, I think I think also sometimes somebody's a brand new creator and then they get themselves way over their head. Right. And then I think it's a good lesson. I really do that. You get way over your head and then you crawl your way out because you're never, ever going to do that again, ever. I'm sure you've been over your head. I've been over my head and things mm -hmm. and we you crawl yourself out and you make sure you never, ever do it again. And then if you do it again, you're like, I swear this is the last time, everybody. I swear. Um, but again, I think it's a good lesson, especially if you're serious. I also think it's very interesting because you've seen it and I've seen it that there are campaigns that are way overpriced. Right. And, and I think that's a big issue. And I've actually not backed campaigns because I'm like, you're asking $25 for a cover A. Right. That's a little pricey. And also, I'm a strong believer of upsell, where if I don't know your book, at all you're brand new you know i want an option where i feel like i can put 10 bucks in maybe spend six dollars in shipping and i don't know if i'm gonna like it but i don't right. feel like spending 25 dollars on something that i don't know if i'm gonna like or love and then i've read books and i'm like this wasn't that good and it's 25 dollars plus shipping and i'm like what the fuck did i just buy and i think that's a real issue as well because that deters people as well saying yeah. I just bought crap and is every book on Kickstarter that way. And I think that's another thing that creators don't understand is your book's not going to please everybody. But if you're charging 25 or $30, mm -hmm. your book better be damn good. Right. I mean, it better be because that's a lot of money compared against DC, Marvel, or even Zenisco for four bucks in the comic shop. Right. It, and it's not... The, the negative thing about comics versus other collectibles, my rookie card doesn't mean a lot. Whatever my best book is means a lot. So it's not like normal collectibles where, oh, this first book that he did was great. So there's no incentive to, to back a creator who you're like, I think he may have the chops and he may do it later. It's almost better to just wait till he does that later book. That's better. Because there's no incentive. That first writing gig doesn't mean anything in the world of comics. Which is one of the things I love about comics. Of like, the collector's market is so great. Like, you know, Marvel's like, no, uh, 181 is not the first appearance of Wolverine. It's 180. Because he's stuff And comic collectors are, the fuck it is, it's 181. <laughs> like, and, and it sticks. Because 
comic creators, uh, comic uh, buyers have that much control. It's amazing. It, that's one of the coolest things about comics. But it's also one of those weird things where that first appearance doesn't mean anything. So your book just better hit it out of the park every time. It's a very weird, weird industry. And, and I love it because, again, you know, there's a lot of money that could be made in this industry right. buying the right books. And I've done it. I have bought books for, for, I mean, everybody knows the story. I don't know if you know this story of one of my most valuable books. I have an Ultimate Fallout 4. Nice. I have two of them. And I got them for free. Nice. Because they were handing them out at Midtown Comics in New York City on free comic book day, Polly Bag Belt. And it's just like, because they couldn't get rid of it. But then all of a sudden, you know, the movie comes out and that book goes skyrocketing. And uh, wait, wait till the live action comes out because that's going to make that book go chaotic sky high. It's going to be fantastic. But the point is that it's one of those weird things where you don't know. And uh, the market is, is, is wild, but it's super interesting in that regard. Um, but I do want to get back to your book because you have yeah. a lot of exclusives. Obviously, it's a lot of fun stuff. I don't know the exact order, but I know this is one of them. Yeah, yeah, that's uh, Tyler's Draw and Talk, so that you buy that from Tyler directly. And it's I think they're all foil, too. And so that that's out there. And I, again, again, I don't know the, the whole thing. And then there's this one. Yeah, that, so that's Space Cadets. In fact, they're talking about it right now on their live show right now. That's a Space Cadets variant. That's a Kunk Star in Texas. And I know this is Kyle's. Yeah, that's Kyle Willis's. Yeah, that's Kyle Bunga Comics. Yeah, you can you can get that from them. Now, 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 I'm not too sure who is on the left side of this one, but I definitely know who's on the right. Right. Um, <laughs> I just want to make that crystal clear. Um, we, we will just nod and, and go in agreement on that one. Um, there's this one, too. Yeah, that, that is a Band of Bards exclusive. That, that comes in regular foil and metal. There's a metal version of that, which is really cool. And then, and then, and then I think this is just the, the cover A. That Tyler did. Right? Yeah, that's that's cover A. Yeah, so in shops you can get cover A, and there's a cover B. That's and cover that's cover A, and then there's cover B right there. The Stan Yak. Yep. Uh, I was just making sure. I was just making sure. And then you can get this too. So if your store on a twenty, you can get the this one. They may have this one for sale. And so obviously that is an incentive cover. I yeah. believe mm -hmm. it is called. Um, and obviously that is going to be limited to a certain amount based on how many were ordered. Correct, correct, correct. And then, and then, and then there's, oh, I don't know, I don't know. Did, did, yeah, this is You Promised Me Comics variant. Trying to see whatever I have on my table here that you don't have. Hold on. Let me see what I got. This is because I have this one. I might as well show them all. If I, whatever I got. Oh, that's number two. Yeah. So that's number two. Um, yeah. And then, and then, got this then one? I don't know. I don't, I don't, I don't, I'm out of ideas because I couldn't find all of them. That was a yeah, they're, they're hard to find. You got to follow me on Facebook to find them. I'm trying to do it. And by the way, if you don't know, I'm doing a thing. If you get all of them, if you get all nine, you don't have to get like the shiny versions of everything or whatever. You don't have, you can get the cheapest version of everything. If you get them all, I, uh, the first person who sends me a picture of all of them together, I'm going to send them a CGC copy, uh, whatever cover they want. Cause I I've got all of them as creator, uh, whatever cover they want signed by the whole team. Yeah, so, so that, that's something to be on the lookout for. Um, and obviously, that's super cool in that regard. And uh, obviously, you know, you know, you got all of them. And I don't have that one either. Yeah, this is Danny's from uh, from the collective. And so obviously, there, there's a lot of them. And so well, what is that like, too? Because this is one of the things that you have a lot of variants. And it's good for the stores. It's good for you. It looks good. It also gives choice. Because let's be realistic. So you might say, look, I don't just want to cover A. I'm not really interested. I'm a big variant guy, and I want something that's fun for my local store. And, you know, obviously you want to support local businesses, but also you want to appeal to that variant collector. Because right. somebody might, you know, you know, I'll throw this one up because this is one of my favorites. You know, somebody might say, look, I love that, you know, a little raccoon guy over there. Um, yeah. uh, and, and, and I don't really like this cover. For it just doesn't appeal to me. Nothing against, you know, fan of Bards, but I love something like this, or I love something like this, right? right? And so now you're giving them a choice. So what is that like? Because it's very important, I feel, to give customers choices. Yeah. Um, 
So one of the things that I did when I started, I know the variant cover game a little bit, you know, so I know it. So I, I reduce it to a very, very affordable. I actually talked to them and negotiated the deal because to get into a big publisher to get the variant, it's 250 copies. Like it's a big investment and it's hard to flip that many copies. So very complicated. Yeah. Yeah. It's, so for, it's for, a for very, those who don't know, I'm going to, I'm going to just give a size position of what 250 bucks looks like. So if you're a comic collector, you have this little thing called a long box. A long box holds 250 copies to 300. So to have 250 copies of the same book, forget about money, forget about expense, forget about other things that come with that. You know, you have a whole long box of books that are the same. And it's great if you have a big audience, but even if you still have a big audience, it's a long box First thing, if you have 50 copies, that is one third of a short box. Just, just, just to give a visual of how much space that actually looks like. Sorry for interrupting. Continue. No, you're good. You're good. So it's hard to set. In fact, actually, uh, I, I want to give a, a, just a better example. This is 50. That's 50 books. Exactly. So that's, it's not a lot, but, uh, you know, but it's a financial nut, but that's, if you think about your local comic store, that's more than they have on a rack every week. They know even a big book, they tend to only have 25. Like that's, that's a big book is, is having 25 copies, you know, uh, cause they, they, they may have ordered 50, but it'll be 25 in the, in the boxes and 25 on the shelf. So we wanted to create something that was very easy to do it and it allows and make it so affordable and make it so you can make your money back quickly and allow them to help promote my product. And I think that that's part of the reason why we sold out is people were so interested in the product and where they could get the covers and this and that. I think that helped uh, us sell out uh, and it helps us build a brand, but it's also really hard because Travis, I take responsibility for every one of those stores. The minute I'm done this show, I'm going to jump on Jen show and try to help sell her cover. You know, I went to Kyle's to sell a server. If you follow my Facebook, I promoted stuff. I'm going to go to Famous Faces from 4 to 7 tomorrow to sell their cover. I'm going to sell that cover really, really hard because you invested in me, right? So that that's – but that's not everybody's take on these things. Like, not everybody does that. So it's a big risk, but I also think it's a, it's a really rewarding because it's really special to have your own cover, you know, to have something that's yours, that you own, that you – put into the world. And I know that a lot of people have really loved just supporting me being like, Oh man, like we, I get to sell a cover and I can support my friend and, and show that I believe he's a good writer and that he can level up, you know, that I selling it to podcasts. And I don't think it's a, I, I don't think it's a bad thing. We even talked about you. We just couldn't get the artist that we wanted to get for it. You know, it was complicated. A lot of stuff went, went sure, yeah, yeah, yeah. But it, was, it was, it was, it was, it was very complicated what would happen. And a lot of just things, just a lot of miscommunications and a lot of stuff just went yeah. eerie and things were just missing with everybody yeah, on that. It happens. So it's all good. It's all good. My, my money found a new home. Um, yeah. anyway. And I didn't know what I was doing either, right? Like I didn't know how to do that. Like that, the negative of that, let me tell you the negative of that. Because I spent so much time doing that, that was less shops that I called. Because I focused on making sure they had their art and, and they had a right artist. I connected with artists, figured out their budget, like blah, 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 blah. That's less time me calling Nebraska and going, hey, Comics R Us, do you uh, know about Coins Judas? So, and, and I saw that in the direct market, like my sales weren't what I wanted them to be. They were fine. Obviously, I sold better than anything else over there. But I personally had a number that I didn't hit. Yeah, what was that like? Because obviously, not to put you on the spot with me, um, th things happen. Life, life moves on. It's it's just business, and it, it's nothing personal. Um, right. just, just because if you want to put the dead horse in your bed, don't blame me. Um, right, sure. <laughs> in case anybody didn't get the reference, it's The Godfather. Um, but anyway. Also, even if you didn't see The Godfather, if you watch Sopranos, the same thing happens, so you'll get it. <laughs> I, I would never kill a horse. They're, they're, they're so majestic. But anyway, <laughs> um, I, plus I don't really know where to find one or ride one, so, so it right. would not be great. If kind of hard near where you live, right? I got you. I, I mean, I, I I live in in New England, so so it's actually not that hard. But but but. Well, all right, fair enough. With, with, with my disability, I don't think it's a good idea for me to drive a horse anytime soon. Notice I said drive a horse. Um, right. <laughs> 
because 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 I have a Mustang. But anyway, that's not the point. Um, <laughs> I'm sorry, sorry. The, the comedy hour and the interview with Travis sometimes gets crossed. Um, <laughs> you should you should see February 6th with Raven Gregory. That that thing's gonna be. Oh, uh, Raven Gregory's uh, a riot. He takes over. He he. I am a guest on his show on my show. It's gonna be. Fantastic. Oh wow! It's gonna be wild. <laughs> it's gonna be what what did you say? Double stream at the same time? <laughs> oh no no no! He's just gonna take over my show. And I was gonna be like, okay, it's gonna be great. Okay. But but what 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 was this like though? Actually running quarterback. Getting back to the question, because you had to make sure that a the deal was going through. You never did this before. Obviously, things sometimes go wary. Things sometimes go south. Things get complicated. And what was that like? Because also, I mean, you're coordinating. And I would imagine some of these shops never really dealt with a low print number, making sure that they were taken care of, making sure that, you know, they knew that they weren't going to get swindled because that's a real big deal with, with, with a brand new company. Nothing against bands of bards, but they're brand new. And there's trust issues, I feel, in comics. And so what was that like reassuring? Because that's a real issue. Not to put you on the spot, but I yeah, think- no, it was the worst. Um, I'll be honest, I I hated it. Like I was not used to the diamond. Like it comes and go. Like Kickstarter, I know when I'm ready to launch, and I know I have 30 days to promote that. I just got to be online and do it. But when you're dealing with direct market diamond, I I am pulled in a whole bunch of directions. I'm pulled for variant covers. I'm pulled for calling stores. I have to email a bunch of stores. I have to make sure the book is done. Right. Because the book was not finished. Like they solicited one of the things that they did. They solicited the book before it's finished. I had to make sure that Tyler was working. The colorist was working. Everybody's getting paid. Everybody's doing their thing. And we're all just hoping that this will work. It, it's it's crazy. And then it it goes to a website and the website like right now, Diamond has pulled down last month's previews. But you can still put in last month's numbers till Thursday. So I'm not promoting it because it's not on the website. Like, no, no, no. You've got to keep promoting it. Got another week. Like all these things and like finding out uh, Band of Bards is not on final order cutoff. So what final order cutoff means is there's a website that'll give them like an extra three weeks to decide if they really want to keep the numbers where they're at. Like they don't have that. So I have to push extra hard and educate people. And then there's an incentive cover. People didn't know how to fill out the incentive thing. Like it was wild figuring out. And it, it's really distracted me. Like, you know me. You followed me for many years. I should be launching a Kickstarter by now. Like, my stuff is done. My stuff shipped. Like, I, I'm still shipping some holiday spirits. So that's not 100% true. But, like, my stuff is mostly shipped. I'm ready to do a next Kickstarter. I haven't even built the Kickstarter fully yet because this these two issues took so much of my time trying to figure it out. And then even more so with um, – Granite State Punk. And it's and they don't do it. Publishers don't do it. Look at publishers' websites. They don't promote. They'll do one Facebook post or two about your property. That's not their job. It's your job to promote the book. It's your job to get up there if you want it to sell. And that's that's a hard pill to swallow when you're giving them the majority of the money. I think it's it's a real issue. And I think that that, you know, I mean, obviously you started the interview with me and Tyler. Yeah. And, and about about that whole thing about getting, you know. Should, you know, you pay for platforms right. and it's, it's tricky because guess what? You know, there's only so much of you that goes around. And I'm not saying that, you know, obviously there, there was some fair criticisms and I get the argument. But again, this is why you pay for somebody to be your marketing guru or be running point for you on marketing. This is why sometimes maybe you have to pay for ads on podcasts right. because guess what? There's only so much of you that goes around. And, there's, and also it's the idea is that. You know, if somebody's asking five bucks, it's a lot different than when somebody's asking five grand. And so, you know, I think it's something that a lot of creators don't understand is promoting your product and doing it effectively is very complicated. And I think you need both a paid and earned strategy. You need a buy and earn media strategy. And not, not you personally, but just in general, because clearly listening to you not being able to run a Kickstarter and do your next thing. I mean, that gives an idea. And then also, I mean, I, I would imagine, and correct me if I'm wrong, you're also not pushing out another book. You're not pushing out something like No Contest. You're not right? pushing yeah. out other things. And so clearly, I mean, it's a lot of fun to have a book in Diamond and get a lot of attention and get a lot of press for it. But there's also sacrifices that come at this. And this is where it gets very interesting. 
And I think that's something that a lot of people don't understand is that managing that is really, really, really hard. Right. Yeah, I, I, it's it's a tough thing. And I think, uh, you know, people don't appreciate the shows that are on, you know, half the time you have guests and they don't even share it after the fact, like that you're on, on the shows, you know, it's trying to figure that out. Oh, it's even worse. It's even worse. I'll tell you a crazier story. Somebody said to me, I said, hey, could you share it out? Their response to me was that your show is not my brand when they were on. Weird. I was completely like, what are you talking about? I, I, I did not understand any of that statement. Right. And so I don't speak to that person anymore. They are, as far as I'm concerned, dead. And right, they reached sure. out for an interview and I'm like, I don't know you. I don't know you. We're, like, we're, we're, we're not on the brand. <laughs> what? what did you say? You were like, oh, I, you're not in my brand anymore. I'm sorry. <laughs> it, 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 it was it was a very weird statement. And and but but I don't even think I thank you. I think you goes a long way. A share goes a long way. And I think that, that that you hit it perfectly. I think a lot of people do not appreciate the effort that goes into this. And I think it's a real issue. And I think they don't appreciate the fact that it stays up forever. This will be up on YouTube and somewhere on the internet till long after you and me are dead. Yeah. To, be, to be quite honest, not to be crude about it. Yeah. I'm not saying that's near. Hopefully it's not for you or me. But the idea is that this interview is going to be up on the internet for at least another 30 years. Right. And so you don't know what that means. You don't know what's going to happen. You don't know who's going to see this interview. And there's been plenty of people who have seen interviews of mine who have gotten deals in comics and movies because they've somebody randomly stumbled across something of mine. And they're like, I kind of want to know more about that. And then they reached out to that person directly. Is that I saw you on this show? It happens a lot more than people realize. Yeah. It, and I, I don't think. I just want to thank you or a hug. That's really what I want, guys. I don't want to say the person, uh, but I, uh, my primary job is a web design job. And I know someone who leveled up and went to Marvel in DC. And they had the bleeding cool article about the message of, of their stuff. Um, and it barely made a blip of new traffic to his website, barely made a blip of getting him new fans. But I've seen him be on YouTube shows that have YouTube audience. And not only have I seen them blip on his website, I've seen them make sales on the website, you know, on doing stuff. You can see the sales on Kickstarter, you know, when you're live and when people are paying attention and not everyone is going to produce, but it's about doing them and promoting them because people will, even if this, let's say you, I was promoting Kickstarter right now, even if someone didn't buy it from your show, maybe it's that when they see me on three other shows, because they follow you, they follow this comics by the Bay who, who's, who's in the chat. They follow comics burrito. And they follow all these shows because they like YouTube shows about comics. Eventually they're going to buy and all of those help do that. You don't just give it credit to the one that they paid on. It's the track. They're like, dude, this guy is on all my favorite shows. Clearly I should pay attention to him. I have a story and, and I have an eBay business and I did an interview about seven years ago and every year it refers to me about a hundred dollars of business because somebody sees that. And clearly, you know, I ask and I've come to the conclusion that it refers to me anywhere from 100 to about $200 worth of business. That was seven years ago. That's $1,400. You might say, oh, but that's only $1,400. But guess what? I only did the injury once and it has referred me a good chunk of money. Right. And so that's what I think people also don't understand is that maybe somebody doesn't see something today. Also, I'm going to be posting this into 60 Facebook groups. You know, starting, you know, probably tomorrow and then the day after. And now all those people are going to be like, cool. What's Coin of Judas? Never heard of it. What's this book? Let's go check it out and let's go see what's going on with it. And there you go. And now all of a sudden you even get name recognition so that when issue two or issue three comes out, all of a sudden people might be like, cool. What's Coin of Judas? And then it pops up. Right. But I, I really what what I think is that I think there needs to be more appreciation and Maybe I'm a little too close to this issue, but I really think that people cop an attitude with, with, with things because they want instant gratification right. and they want 10,000 views on an episode when they don't look at it saying, cool, what is my name recognition and how is this going to look long term? 
Right. And also, you know, what am I building? But I digress. It's not a, a, a me and Tyler definitely went to war over that. Together. Yeah, I will be on anybody's show. Like, as long as it's, I, I wouldn't say fit my brand, as long as it's not to, to snipe somebody, right? I bet on shows where, like, we're going to talk bad about this other creator. I don't want to do that. That's not, I'm about creating a positivity. So, as long as you're not talking bad and you're about promoting, I'll be on anybody's show because it's about building my new brand. I love when you YouTube me, you see tons of interviews from tons of different people from tons of different walks of life. Like, that's that's the way it should be because I, I want to kill this direct market. I want you to be able to, I want you to be able to have me on the show five years from now if I've made it to Marvel in DC because we've had a relationship. We get to refer to all all these old shows, you know, that's what it should be is building these relationships. Come by the Bay, I just, I just met them. I'm messing with a gig because it's been fun in the group. Like I want these relationships to build with it. I want, that's what comics is about, is about following a creator that you love and growing with them. So I want to be on that journey. And the only way I can be on that journey is continue to put out content and be on shows to talk about that content. I'll be very honest. Relationships are very interesting. The only reason why I got both Bella's interviews, so I did Bella Rockefeller and Bella Madison. They fight for a company called Laundry Fighting Championship, and I've gotten a few others. I've interviewed a few people from there, like Jen Thomas yeah. and some other people, but I interviewed a guy named Tommy Bell. Bella Madison has 150,000 Instagram followers. I shoot her a message on Instagram, and within seconds – Probably, probably about 20 minutes later, she shoots me a message back saying, I would love to, because I have a relationship with Tommy Bell. I have a relationship with that company and I've built it over years. And I think that's something that people forget is relationships will always trump, no pun intended, um, that they will always trump viewers. They will always trump followers and they will always trump a variety of other things such as clout. Because when, re when somebody recommends you who is well-respected, and then you also have a little bit of a connection, you're going to get what you want. First thing, you know, how many views you have, but I digress. But yeah, it's, a, it's, a, it's super interesting. And uh, I hope I hope you make it to Marvel, even though I'm not a Marvel fan. But I am. So therefore, uh, that's <laughs> my goal. Uh, so wow. it's not your goal. I'm trying to achieve my goals. I used to always joke about that when I was a kid. I was like, I'm never going to make it to Marvel. Not because I'm not talented enough. It's just I'm going to make it to the top and they're going to be like, DC is going to be like, all right, we'll hire you. Um, it's, it, it's very interesting. I, I have no desire at the moment to write comics. Um, at the moment, I am perfectly fine in my business. That doesn't mean that I won't draw a comic. I made that crystal clear. I am not an artist, but I think it'll be fun to draw a comic with a crayon. Um, and uh, you could write me a story to draw with my crayon. <laughs> Harold and his magic purple crayon, guys. I would just change the name from Andrew and his magic crayon and we'll make it a green crayon. I, I promise it won't be good. It won't be good, but it'll be entertaining. Yeah, I gotta say that. Drawing, I'm just saying we got a home run here. That's my hardest thing that I've now I've, that I have a certain level of clout and like experience. Um, artists can always give me stuff, right? They can draw a character and like help me out. A writers can't, and it seems so pretentious, right? Imagine going to somebody like, let's say you're a famous comic writer, you write some series, but you're not, you're not as big as me, right? You're, I'm higher than you, and I'll be like, hey man, I could write like a little bit of your book if it make you feel better. Like how it's, it's insulting, like like it's crazy. Um, um, so I, I don't know how to give back a lot of times. I I have like I wrote um, I wrote an issue a hot shot for. Uh, this FSK because he's drawn so many of my characters for free and I've used some as covers and I've, I've given him comps and stuff like that, but I just wanted to get back. So one day I was just like, Hey, I wrote an issue. It's a one shot. If you want to use it, whatever. And he's like, Oh, it'll be part of my run. I'm really excited about it. And I was like, here's a character I created, use it, do your thing, you know? Um, but yeah, it's, it's, it's good to, to hear those things. Yeah, no, at some point I'll write something, but, but, but right, right now, I'm perfectly fine being on the other side of this trade, which is more the business side, because that's where my real skill set is. Right. And, uh, I think, I think, I think, you know, you know, hopefully by, by June, I'll be able to launch my class and educate a bunch of people who are both in Kickstarter and outside, because that is my biggest pet peeve is I think a lot of creators are really shitty at business in this right. sector. And I think, I think, I think it's a pitfall. 
I think it is sad. I don't think there's been anything that is educated. And that's just what I've seen on both Kickstarter, both Indiegogo. And I think it is the biggest fail of the community is that there has been a lack of education right. collectively. And that education has come very clicky. And I think it's a shame because I think it actually has not, it, it has slowed down what could actually be done in comics. But again, 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 I, I also, it, nobody's required to, to educate anybody, but I think that it's a big issue. If you want to collectively make something better, you know, there needs to be, I feel, more generosity and also constructive criticism versus plain criticism. Right. But again, well, I, you know, weird on that front, but I digress. I agree. But yeah, I want to back out of all this because I do want to talk about what else you got going on. You got a crazy 2023 as soon as, as this thing calms down a little bit. Yeah, gonna, yeah. So I got it all for the next six months, though. It's going to be hell for you. It's going to be wild. So I've got Coins of Judas um, 1 and 2. So that's January and February. I've got uh, March. I've got Great at State Punk. And it's March 15th. So that's a big uh, – that's, that's going in the direct market through Scout. So that's really cool. So that's all my direct market stuff. But later in the year, I'm going to have Coins of Judas, The Gambler, 1 and 2, and Great at State Punk, Breaking Edge. So those will be more – direct market stuff that'll be later in the year that I'll have release dates later. Then my, my release schedule for, uh, for uh, orange cone is kind of all over the place. Cause I want to do the broke down trade this year. I got Buddha nations four to finish that off. I got expired two. That's that didn't even come out last year. That book was 2000, uh, 2020. Yeah, two, no, 2021 was the last time that issue came out. So that needs to get out. No contest to, we've got obviously Cthulhu Maids Neverland. My wife wrote a, a musical comic. So it's a comic that has a song connected to it. So it's a super delicious sing-along comic with cottage cheese. Uh, I do the Tales of the Collective stuff. Uh, you know, no, uh, I think I mentioned no contest, but no contest again. We're trying to do five issues this year. It's, it's wild, man. Like it's a wild, wild year. Um, and that's without me creating anything new. That's just getting stuff that uh, need additional like uh, issues and stuff. It's crazy. It's crazy. My 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 year is a little crazy too, but but not as crazy as yours. Um, but yeah, no, no, no. You you got a lot of stuff going on, and obviously, as all this starts coming out and dealing with it, and even just expanding and leveling up. Obviously, you got that going on, and you got your show going on with leveling up and that too. And so you got a lot of stuff going on, man. A lot of stuff. A lot of stuff is going to be exciting for you. Um, obviously, very much testing Kickstarter versus the direct market is a big thing for you this year. Right. And uh, between Scout and obviously Bands of Arts. And so, yeah, there's just a lot of stuff for you. And it's exciting. It's exciting. Uh, yeah, it's it's wild. But I think I think it's going to be worth it. I, I think that this year is going to be the level up year. Like, I think this is the year that we've been talking about. You and I have talked about this a long time. Um, you know, I think this is a year where uh, everything comes to, you know, all I've been working for kind of sees where it lands. And then 2024 and 2025 is me figuring out what I need to focus on. Right. Is it going to be the direct market? Is it going to be more Kickstarters? Is it going to be uh, working with more publishers, whatever that looks like. And I'm excited about it. I'm, I'm really excited about the opportunity. Uh, I have a great support group, with my wife and my family and um, fellow creators. So I've been able to do that. Even things like comic level up, like I'm doing that program because I'm at the, I'm at the end of my knowledge, right? Like I'm at the end of this is I, everything I know. I keep putting it out there. So I need to learn from people who've made it to that next level and what that looks like for them. And, and what I can pick from their brains to, to get to that next level. Um, because there's no one way to make the comics, right? There's no, uh, if you look at anybody's story, some people intern, some people, you know, did movies first, some people wrote novels first. There's all these different ways to get into this. So it's just finding that, 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 that path for me. Now that that's interesting that obviously there gets to a point where you need to gain more knowledge. And obviously I, I'm, very much at that stage in certain sectors myself. So I understand. And obviously, I mean, I'm listening to, to a bunch of people on YouTube and I'm sure. not necessarily talking to people, but, but, but obviously I found indirect mentors. And I think it's a really important thing to understand 
for anybody in life, there gets to a point where who do you look at? And also, who do you listen to? Because I put up a Facebook post. And I think it's really, really, I can't remember it word for word, but the basic premise is that I like to shut up and listen to people that conflict with my views is essentially the post. Because, and the reason why I say that is that if you have a disagreement with me on cryptocurrencies, and I'm a big crypto guy now, yeah. but about three years ago, I wasn't. So I started listening to people who were into that space and they started giving me some thought process. And obviously I'm not an NFT guy. I'm not anti NFT, but I had a bad experience, but I like certain cryptocurrencies. And I think it's very important to do that as well, because again, there's no right way how to make a comic book. There's no wrong way. Actually, there are wrong ways how to make a comic. Let's not kid ourselves. Um, But I think the point is that it's very interesting that you're doing that too. So obviously you got a lot of stuff going on. So yeah. Um, but we've been speaking for about an hour and five minutes. A lot of stuff I could speak to you for hours and pick your brain. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, same, sure. same, same. Yeah, 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 yeah. I, absolutely. But I do want to give you a chance to promote yourself. So where can people find you, bother you, support your campaign, pick up you know, your comics, all that fun stuff? Um, uh, yeah, so you the, the best place to find me is uh, travisgib.substack.com. Um, if you want to order any of my books, you go to orangecombproductions.com. Um, in fact, I'm going to be updating the website with uh, both Grand State Punk, Breaking Edge, and uh, Cthulhu, not Cthulhu, uh, Holiday Spirits, too, very, very soon. I actually may even throw some coins of Judas up there, just basic covers, not not variant covers, but basic covers. So if you're interested in all that, uh, that'll be the place to, to, to go and do that. But I really want people to get to my sub stack. I think we can build a relationship there and then you can learn who I am. Uh, that'll tell you about my YouTube shows and all that. Cause I don't want to be a YouTube star. Like people get confused all the time. They're like, Hey, Travis, can I be on your show? I was like, what show? <laughs> and then they're like, Oh, your, your creator hangout thing. Oh, I just do that when I want to, like, it's not a show. It's a thing. Like I'm doing one on Thursday, this Thursday, but that doesn't mean I'm going to do one next Thursday or a week from now or a month from now. I do it when I have some specific friends who I know I can help get to the next level on their Kickstarter because I have a name. I have a presence. My voice means something in the community. So I use that voice for good. Uh, Comic Level Up is a show. But again, even that, if nobody watched it, I'm completely okay because I am fans of all these guys I'm talking to and like picking their brains. So I don't care. I mean, watch it, but I don't care if you don't. <laughs> yeah, no, this is a show. This is a show. It's meant to be a show. It's meant right. to be <laughs> It has a specific pur- purpose. Um, and uh, obviously, I want people to watch it. Um, there's a lot of knowledge that could be gained from this show, but there's also a lot of entertainment that also could be gained. And uh, in fact, you might actually become dumber if you watch it. Um, right. <laughs> any promises? I'm just saying that I don't think, or or you might be thoroughly entertained, but if you have a girlfriend, some right. episodes you might not want to watch with your girlfriend around. Um, but I digress. We all know what those episodes are. Um, it might be a fella <laughs> episode or double bellas. Um, there's a joke in there somewhere. Um, but I digress right there. Obviously, I'm a show, but I absolutely appreciate you coming on, Travis. I want people to go to their comic book store tomorrow. You might want to go early when your store opens up and hope that they have coins of Judas because it may be a hard book to get in a first printing at the very least. Um, and then, yeah, absolutely. So that's something to keep in the back of everybody's head. Also, you know, that's something. And it also, you know, if you want those variants, obviously, you know, there's a bunch of stores that have it. And if you go on Facebook, I'm pretty sure that the Travis's Facebook page or one of them, you'll be able to find where you get those variants as well, because some of them might fancy, you know, your viewership. So there you go. Um, that's very important. And then as far as I'm concerned about me, obviously I am a show. I appreciate when people watch this show, um, <laughs> you know, it means a lot. It means a lot. The exact sure opposite sure. of me, the exact opposite. I am a comic writer. He is a, uh, a, a show uh, guy. Uh, what is it? Podcast host dude thing. <laughs> Yeah, I, I'm not saying eventually I might write a comic. I might write something eventually yeah. or produce something. I'm not too sure what I'm going to do. But I am definitely a show at the current moment. I appreciate when people watch it. I appreciate when people follow me on social media. It means a lot when you follow me on Twitter at Pop Anime Comics. 
uh, Instagram Pop Anime Comics, Facebook Pop Anime Comics. I had a, a Red Bubble T-shirt store that is making fun of Gundam and Taco Bell. So it's available in 16 different colors. I appreciate that because that helps to support this show. I have Buy Me a Coffee. That means a lot as well. Um, I also take advertisers. If you would like to advertise on the show, you are more than welcome to. Um, again, all of that is not necessary, but I absolutely appreciate when people subscribe on YouTube as well, which is pop out of my comics. But that's everything that I have going on, and I am going to let you have the final word. Uh, once you do this, come back tomorrow. Make sure you back it. Or not back it. That's not even a word anymore. Go to your comic store and buy it. You don't back it anymore. See, I don't understand the direct market, Andrew. Go, buy this book, please. Please, I need you to buy it. I don't even know where my copy went. Here, buy one of the variants. I don't care which one. The, just go and buy it at your store. <laughs> well, I think that is a perfect place to end, everybody. That is a wrap.